Hi everyone, welcome to a new session of CFL Level 2. Today we will be starting with the next reading of FRA which is Employee Compensation. Now Employee Compensation for the purpose of your syllabus is focused on just two types of special compensation. So of course an employee works for the company, he gets a salary. But aside from that salary, aside from the regular payment that he gets for the work that he renders for the company, there are also two special payments. Those two special payments are specifically pension and any sort of share based payment. So bonus shares to the employees which is also known as employee stock options. So we have stock options and we have pension as the two special kind of compensations that we'll be covering in our level 2 curriculum. Now the good thing is this entire reading as a whole it's not that big of a reading as our previous reading was but I'll still split it into two sessions mainly because I don't want a singular session being over one hour because I want each session to be just about enough time that you are able to keep your concentration intact from the start till the end. The good thing is this entire chapter, the share based payments, it's only theoretical in nature because anything about share options or share conversions, we have discussed at various points and as such there is no new material in FRA. So we just have a small theoretical discussion about how share based payments work. We'll cover that at the very end, probably just the last 10 minutes of our entire discussion for this reading. Bulk of this reading is going to be focused on pension payments. And within the pension section of this reading, we have two major sets of calculations. We look at one of them in the first session and the second one in the next session of this reading. So with all of that out of the way, let's do a quick recap of what relevant material we know from level one. Now, if you remember from level one, you had a very brief introduction about how pension plans work, specifically in the topic of non-current liabilities in your FRA itself. Now, over there, we studied that a pension plan can be of two types. You have defined contribution plan and then you have defined benefit plan. And they were different in terms of their characteristics from each other. In defined contribution plan, the employer would make a fixed payment to the pension account of the employee every month so long as the employee is working with that particular employer. And once that payment was done, employer's obligation was done. He had no further responsibilities from his side. How that pension account is to be managed, that was the responsibility of the employee himself. He would take care of all the investments. The only thing employer was responsible for was to make those regular contributions into the pension account. What happens with those contributions? Not the responsibility of the employer. And as a result, if we talk about defined contribution plan, think of yourself as the employer. You have some employees working for you for which you have to make a fixed amount of contribution every year. Once you make that contribution, you don't have any further obligation. You don't have any other responsibilities which creates a situation where our discussion for employee compensation isn't really complicated when we are talking about defined contribution plan because whatever contribution an employer has made in one year, that is his expense. He transfers it to income statement as a pension expense and he's done. That's the end of accounting treatment. It's just like any other expense. However, things get complicated with defined benefit plan. And this is going to be the key portion of our discussion throughout level 2 reading. Defined benefit plan was a kind of pension plan where instead of giving a fixed amount right now, employer would give or he would commit to some amount. That amount would be calculated on a fixed basis. So you will have a parameters how that amount will be calculated. But the employer was committing to some amount being paid after retirement for a certain period of time. So instead of employer focusing on how much he should pay right now into the pension account, he rather took on the obligation that when the employee retires, I will make a recurring amount, a regular payment to the employee as his pension post retirement. That's why this is also known as post employment benefits. So as a result, once the employment ends, now the employer will be responsible to make certain payments. Let's say I have an employee whose age is 40 years old 
and he would retire at the age of 60. So employer already knows that if this employee works with me for next 20 years, I will then have to start making payments to him in the form of pension starting from his age of 61. Maybe let's say for the next 15 years, so from age 61 to 75, the employer will have to make payments. So just like in time value of money at level one quants you did, if I know the payments I have to make after 15, uh, after 20 years, and I know the number of payments I'll be making, if I can just get present value of them, I can start making investments right now. So as such in defined benefit plan, the things get a little complicated because one part of the uh, entire concept is to estimate how much money we I probably be paying once the employees start retiring. So estimating how much money you might need, that's the one side of equation. The second part of the equation is, how should I manage my investments right now so that when I need the money to make pension payments, I have that money available with me. Because effectively company will not just start keeping cash every year. If you keep idle cash, it loses value. So company will set aside some funds and then invest them such that those returns are also adding to the company's benefit pool. So as such, this is just an outlook of what we'll be studying at level two. At level two, our intention is to study defined benefit plan in much more detail. So this was the recap of level one. Let's start with the discussion of how exactly the defined benefit plan is structured. So let's start with having a better understanding of what exactly the defined benefit plan is. And as I said, it has two components. One is figuring out how much payment you will have to make in the future. And second part is figuring out where should I invest my money right now so that I can make sure I have the money I might need for the future. So one part is figuring out the liability. What money, what obligation will I as an employer have? And the second part, which we'll cover later on, that is about figuring out how much investment should I make right now so that my obligations can be met at the requisite time. So our first point of discussion is about calculating what the obligation is. It is known as projected benefit obligation. And in IFRS, the same thing is known as present value of defined benefit obligation. So we sh have a short form of this as PBO. And in IFRS, we call it present value of defined benefit obligation. So it's just a change of name. However, the concept is same. Now, projected benefit obligation is nothing but present value of all pension payments that the employer is expecting to pay. And this will include all factors such as salary increases, the expected salary increase that an employee can have till his retirement. How many years do we expect him to live post his retirement? So there will be an actuarial element as well, which is again, not our concern. It would be something that the actuarials often do calculations for and we use them as it is. So you have details about growth rate of salary. You will have details about how many years the money will be drawn. You'll also have details about what will be the terms and conditions of the pension, how pension amount is to be calculated, how much amount will I pay. And if after all of those adjustments, I simply calculate the present value of all of those payments, that is how much obligation an employer has. So basically, I am supposed to make some payments after retirement of the employee. What is the present value of those payments subject to certain terms and conditions? That is my projected benefit obligation. Now, projected benefit obligation has a few components. So first is the current service cost. Current service cost is simply the increase in obligation that happens during a financial year simply because the employee is still working with us. So normally we run this entire process with the assumption that the employee is going to retire with our organization itself. However, if I know the entire pension that is supposed to be paid and I make 100% of it as an obligation to pay itself, that will not be uh, concurrent to the accounting rules of presenting a true and fair picture. So as such, what we do is we do calculations in such a manner that every year we absorb some part of the obligation. So if the employee is working with us for the next 20 years, I want the obligation part not to show up all of a sudden at the start. Rather, I want the obligation part also to be bifurcated into 20 years. So the proportionate part of my PBO that I'm showing in any financial year, 
that is known as current service cost now i know outright understanding it with words is a slightly tricky thing don't worry after we have a basic understanding we'll move on to example and i'm sure that would clarify things further now just like we have current service cost the second component is interest cost and interest cost is one of those things that whenever we are calculating present value of anything we need a discount rate so effectively my intention is that i'll treat that discount rate as a sort of return on obligation that if i have present value every year that present value should increase by some value so if, think logically let's say an employee is retiring after 20 years right now if i do the present value i'll discount everything for 20 years but if i do the same valuation after three years i'm no longer discounting for 20 years i will only be discounting for 17 years so effectively there will be an increase in my obligation simply because of passage of time so for that whatever the increase in obligation is due to passage of time due to time value of money not being as significant as it was one year ago that is known as interest cost again both of these components would make more sense with an example now aside from this you have past service cost and you have actuarial gains and losses past service cost simply relates to any adjustments made to the pension plan so when i have a pension plan i have some terms and conditions that okay this is the basis on which i will do the calculation for how much pension an employee will receive if there are some changes made to that any change in the obligation happening because i have changed the terms and conditions of my pension plan that is known as past service cost so this is associated with any changes or amendments made in the pension plan itself and actual gains and losses because we are dealing with some sort of payment structure which revolves around predicting how long uh, an employee would live after the retirement predicting how long the pension should be paid for so i'll have to analyze the mortality rates the healthcare system a lot of other factors and all of those is slightly complicated for the company to do themselves so they use the services of another professional expert known as an actuary so actuary does all of this estimation and he helps the company to properly decide how much benefit obligation they might realistically have and often because in our work also if we have to predict future financials of a company we use some assumptions and as the business environment changes those assumptions can also change and valuations can also change a very similar thing happens with actuarial calculations as well where they are also in their professional opinion giving you the best possible outcome that they can however even that best outcome is based on some assumptions so if due to passage of time some of those assumptions are changing that could also cause a change in my benefit obligation that is actuarial gains and losses now these two last two components these are of the nature where they will be given to you in the exam because you and i are not actually experts to the point where we can calculate this manually so this is something that always an actual expert would give you so as such in your exam you don't have to calculate this same thing goes here as well plan changes have to be calculated on retrospective or prospective basis depending upon the accounting standards being followed and that is again a headache for the accountants not for us so as such last two components these would be given to you our main concern with these is where do we show them whether we show them an income statement or somewhere else that would be a discussion for when we cover the presentation part in the next session let's do an example to understand projected benefit obligation and also current service cost and interest cost in a better let's look at that 